All right. So this morning, we're going to start with a statistic, which is one of my least favorite words because I can barely pronounce it, statistic. It's right there with the word quarreling. I can't get that one right either most of the time. Uh, but we're going to start with a, a, see, look, a stat. We're going to start with a stat. And um, this is that stat. Um, one out of every one of you will die. One out of every single one of you will die. And I know that's not a real happy way to start a, a sermon, let alone a Christmas series. You know, or a, a Christmas sermon, you come in and you're like, hey, look, one day you're going to die. And, and that's it. That's a, that's a terrible way to start. I know it's not very jolly. It's not very merry. Uh, you know, Merry Christmas, you're going to die. Boom. But, but one out of every one of the people in this room uh, will eventually die. Now, of course, unless Jesus comes back and takes us to be with him and all that kind of stuff, you know, that'd be great if that happened right now. That'd be awesome. But, but uh, and if that doesn't happen, then every single person in this building uh, will die at one point. Um, it's, it's a fact of life. It's, it's a fact of uh, living. It's a part of life. Um, and, and you would say, what in the world uh, does that certainty of death have to do with Christmas? Um, but the truth is it has everything to do uh, with Christmas. Um, this morning we're continuing the series um, called The Nightmare Before Christmas, and this morning we are looking at the concept of the nightmare uh, of death, uh, the nightmare of death, because before Jesus, death was a big, big problem. Before Jesus came, um, death was one of those things that led to fear and anxiety and, and, and just uncertainty. And we didn't know uh, what was going on. Death was a huge problem. It was a huge issue before Jesus was born uh, because there was really no answer for death. There was no answer for what happened uh, when the human being died uh, before Jesus, uh, you know, because there was this, this unresolved sin was before between man and, and God. And God, there was sacrifice, but that was so temporary and that was so uh, it, it just incomplete. And it didn't really uh, do it. But, but death was a problem before Jesus. Even back in the Old Testament, uh, we see this problem. Everyone in the Old Testament died with the exception of Elijah and Enoch, but they were a super special exception to the rule. But before Jesus, there was no hope in death. Before Jesus, there was something to be feared, something to be dreaded. Before Jesus, death was kind of a mysterious um, unknown. Uh, you know, the Old Testament, um, you know, doesn't say a whole lot about what happened after death and, and, and before Jesus. And, in fact, uh, the beliefs of the Jewish people about what happened after death changed over uh, the years. And if you study the, the history of the Hebrew people and their belief, and, and you see from, from Adam and Eve all the way to Jesus, you see their beliefs kind of changing over and over and over again. Uh, you can really break it down into two parts. You have this, this time before uh, from Adam and Eve to the exile when they, uh, they go off to Babylon um, they kind of believe one thing and then after that they kind of believe uh, another thing and, and it's, it's all broken into all these different uh, parts so what happened to people what happened to people that died in the Old Testament you know we kind of have this thought we kind of have this thought that if, if people were good and people were righteous and people were holy, um, they would just kind of go and be with God, um, and, and that was it. You know, they would go to heaven. If there were people that were evil and turned their back on God and they were full of sin, then they would just go to hell, and, and, and that was it. Um, you know, but we don't really see that in there. And, and there's also a problem with that, though, is because uh, obviously the problem of sin, you know, one sin is enough to separate us from God. One sin is enough to break us, uh, this, this relationship with God. So we see this problem. Uh, you know, we see this. We don't, you know, we don't really know uh, what's going on with it. Uh, you know, we see in Deuteronomy 28, there's this big, long, uh, it's a huge chapter that you can read on your own. But it's this huge chapter of blessings and curses for righteous lives uh, and, and lives that don't follow God. And, and, and but what you see through this is there's no mention of what happens after you die. It's all about in this life. You know, this it goes on and on. You know, hey, if you live a holy and upright life, your crops will do good. You know, you'll have bread in your basket. You'll have children in your room, everything will be great. Your enemies will be, you know, be defeated. You know, and then the flip side comes in. And, you know, if you turn your back on God and you live against what God, you don't follow his rules, then everything is going to be bad. You'll have no crops. You'll have no children. You'll have no, uh, you know, bread in your basket. And it's this, all of these blessings and curses that the Israel, the people of Israel saw were all on this earth. We're all right now. So the people were confused. People were confused because death was one of those things they were sure, it was a sure thing was going to happen, but it was a source of, of fear and uncertainty. 
Uh, now, even in within the Jewish uh, um, community and the Jewish culture, there were different kinds of deaths. Uh, you could have either a good death or a bad death. And, and I know that's kind of one of those things where you're like, you know, what death is good? Uh, you know, but and, and you would also think that if you lived a holy life and a righteous life, then your death was going to be good. But that really had nothing to do with it. Um, in the Jewish culture, if you lived a long life and you outlived your parents and you died a natural death and you had heirs and sons in which to give your things to, give your land to, give your inheritance to, then you died a good death. But if you lived a short life, if you died early or if you um, died in any way that wasn't natural or you didn't have children or, or your parents were still alive, that was considered a bad death. And, and the Jewish people believed that there were different things that happened to different people um, depending on what kind of death uh, that they had. Uh, it's just this, 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 this uncertainty through the whole thing. If you died a good death, then you would go and rest with your parents. If you died a bad death, you would go to a time where you had some suffering after death. Uh, man, that's one of the outlooks on life. Another outlook that the early Jews had on life was that there was no afterlife. Um, up until the exile, a good majority of them believed that there was nothing after death. That when you died, you just didn't exist anymore. That you went and you rested with your fathers, and that was it. If you read through the book of uh, Chronicles and Kings, you'll see that when a king died, it would say that they lived this many years and they had a good life. They were a good king or a bad king, and then they went and rested with their fathers. Just rest in peace, um, and that was it. Uh, but there was one more view of the afterlife that within itself has a couple different views. Uh, and, and this um, view was called uh, Sheol. And Sheol, it's a, it's a Jewish word that literally means the grave or the pit. Uh, but Sheol was a place where people would go to be purified before they entered into their time of rest. Uh, Sheol was kind of a place to go and, and have your sins uh, burned off of you. And, and of course, there's different views on that, on whether did good people go to Sheol, did bad people, only bad people go to Sheol. There was even a view where there were different layers of, of what Sheol was. And different, you know, if you were a good person, you went to this layer. If you were a bad person, you went to this layer. And it was worse the, the further on you got. Uh, we see this concept of Sheol mentioned in, in Genesis um, where, where uh, Joshua is sold into slavery by his brothers. And they go off and, and they come back and they tell the dad that he's been mauled by a, a wild animal. And they bring the coat to him all bloody. Um, and this is what Jacob, his father, says. It says, then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins. And he mourned for his son for many days. And his sons and his daughters rose up to cover him, but he refused to be covered and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. And thus the father wept for him. So we see here this, this, this man grieving over his son. He says, I'm going to go down to the pit with my son and I'm going to mourn with him. Now, this is one of those things where it would have confused the Jews because here's Joshua, this young man, this upright man who really had no issues, no you know, problems with sin. He followed his father. He followed his God. And then, and then he died, even though obviously he wasn't really dead. Uh, and and, and uh, Jacob believes that he's down in Sheol. So maybe good people go to Sheol as well. Or maybe it's because he went to Sheol because he was a young man who died an unnatural death and died before his father. <clears throat> Can you see where all the confusion is coming in? Uh, in the book of Isaiah, there's another one, account of a biblical character going to Sheol. This is King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king, and he was, he was a very, very sick. And God sends Isaiah to him. He basically tells him, Look, get your house in order because you're going to die. Your days are up. Um, it's, it's all she wrote. But Hezekiah goes, and he prays, and he asks God to give him more time to, to save him. And God answers his prayer and gives him 15 additional years. This is what it says in Isaiah 38. It says a writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, after he'd been sick and recovered from his sickness. I said, in the middle of my days, I must depart. I'm consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said, I, not, I shall not see the Lord, the Lord of the land of the living. I shall look on man no more among the inhabitants of this world, for Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they thank you, as do I, for the Father makes known the children of your faithfulness. So he says, look, I'm going to go down to Sheol for the rest of my days. He's like, and, and down in Sheol, there is no thanking of God. There is no uh, praising God. There's no seeing the world anymore. And 
And it's just another passage there that shows that the good people um, that are good with God end up in Sheol as well. Uh, but, but this place of Sheol obviously was not a good place. It's not a place where you wanted to end up. Uh, Sheol is mentioned 65 times in the Old Testament and not one time is it labeled as a place that would induce visitors to come. Look what Psalm 49 says. It says, the path of those uh, who have foolish confidence, yet after them approve their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death uh, shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule them in the morning. For their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. So, I mean, this is a bad place. This is a place that you didn't want to go. It was a place where, where you didn't, you know, sign up to go to. And the psalmist says that this is a place that, where they were going to go and be consumed. And then he says, but, the, but my God is going to ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. And that's a great picture of what's to come. One more passage on this topic of Sheol from Isaiah 5. It says, therefore, Sheol has enlarged its appetite and it's opened its mouth beyond measure. And the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude will go down. Her revelers, he who exult in her. Man is humbled and each one is brought low. In the eyes of the haughty are brought low. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. It says humanity is lowered in the shield. It says even the royalty, even the top dogs in Jerusalem are sent down. They're brought down and they're lowered in to shield. God is excellent in his justice. He's excellent in his righteousness. I mean, man, when you read just through the Old Testament, you study just the Old Testament on the topic of death and what happens next, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's hard to figure out. Um, you know, this nightmare of death is real and, and it was staring people right into the face, right into their faces. I mean, it was just staring right at them. Uh, right before Jesus was born, this new idea, new concept of the afterlife came in and that was the resurrection of the dead at the day of the Lord. Uh, this was after the exile of the nation of Judah going into Babylon um, and then they were overthrown by the Medes and the Persons. This, this new idea of resurrection comes. In fact, when you study um, the New Testament, you study Jesus' ministry, you can see he's always fighting with these two groups. It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, and the two, the two, um, this, these two groups, their main difference was the Pharisees believed in the resurrection at the end of the day, the Sadducees didn't believe that there was anything. The Sadducees believed that when you died, that was it, uh, that, that there was no soul, there was no spirit realm, there was nothing. The Pharisees believed that we had a soul that would eventually be resurrected at the great day of the Lord. So here what we see is we have all of these different views of what death uh, what happened after death? I mean, they, they believed that, that, that there was no soul. They believed that after death, you just didn't exist. They believed that you would go to this place called Sheol, which was a terrible place where you would be purified, where you could maybe eventually get out and go into rest with your fathers. Uh, there was uh, some that believed in this, this resurrection at the end of the day. What a mess. What a nightmare. I mean, the nightmare before Christmas is the nightmare of death before Jesus came. I mean, just put yourself in the shoes of these people for a moment. Put yourself in their shoes for just a second. I mean, especially if you ever lost someone you love, think about how difficult that would be. Put yourself in a moment where you may be facing the end of your own life and you have no idea what's going to happen next. I mean, think about that. An absolute nightmare. But then here comes Jesus. Here comes the Messiah. Here comes God's own son with clear, clear instructions and clear, uh, a clear picture of what it looks like after death, um, it's no longer a nightmare. Uh, in the 11th chapter uh, of John, there's this great story of death. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but there's this man named Lazarus. Uh, he's a great friend of Jesus's, him and their, uh, his two sisters, Mary and Martha. But Lazarus gets sick and, and while Jesus is away. And Jesus takes his time getting back. And by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is in the grave a few days and Mary and Martha are so mad at Jesus because they believe that if he had just come a little sooner that he could have saved their brother. 
Little did they know that, that Jesus was about to bring him back to life. He was going to save Lazarus from the dead uh, now and then when he went to the cross. Uh, this is from John 11, 23 through 27. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in resurrection on the last day. Look, that's what the Pharisees taught right there. That's that, that same new philosophy that had, had come in. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one who's coming in to the world. So Jesus says, yes, you know, you say that your brother's going to resurrect at the, end of the, at the end of the age. Yes, that is true because I am that resurrection. I am the one who will bring him back to life. I am the one who makes it possible for him to come out of this grave. Now, obviously, Jesus was going to physically uh, bring Lazarus back from the dead uh, here in the next few verses. Uh, but here Jesus is talking about, yes, I am that resurrection. I am the reason that resurrection is possible. He says that anyone who believes in me will never die. Because Jesus came to this earth because the Messiah had been born because Jesus was going to go to the cross and Jesus was going to go to the grave and have victory over death. We no longer have to fear death. We no longer live under this nightmare of death. Uh, his church, um, <clears throat> in his letter to the church of Thessalonica, Paul makes sure that the people knew this. He made sure they knew that this nightmare was over. This is from 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, but we don't want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, about those who are dead, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Paul says you, you don't need to grieve like those who have no hope. You don't need to grieve like those that have no hope because you do have hope because we believe that because Jesus came, because Jesus was born, because Jesus lived this perfect life, because Jesus went to the cross as that perfect and pure sacrifice, taking on the sins of all mankind, and then went to the death and went to the grave and defeated death once and for all. We have hope. That's what, that's what Christmas has to do with this nightmare of death. Because Jesus came, death is defeated. Don't grieve like you have no hope. Instead, know that God is there. Uh, in the upper room, right before the crucifixion, Jesus laid it all out for his disciples from John 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Notice he's about to go to the cross. He's about to go and die this brutal death. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. He says, believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Jesus lets his disciples know exactly what is going on. He says, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place so that when this life is over for you, you've got somewhere to go. You know, when I was a kid, I always I assumed Jesus, you know, being the carpenter that he was, that he was literally going to prepare a place. Like he was literally, you know, on a big construction job in heaven. That's kind of what I thought of as a little kid. Um, but what I understand as I got older was Jesus was going to prepare a place by going to the cross. By going to the cross and going to the grave, that was the preparation that he was doing to, to make heaven possible for us. He is letting them know that death is not the final piece. He is letting them know that there is more than this life. Jesus is letting them know that all they have to do is follow him and they will be there for all of eternity. And of course, poor Thomas, he has no idea uh, where they're going and what's going on. And Jesus says, look, I am the way. He's like, I am the way that's going to lead you back to the Father. He says, I'm, I'm going to prepare your, your eternal home. And he did that by being victorious over death. So why is it that death is not a nightmare anymore? It's because of Jesus. It's because Jesus came. It's because Jesus went to the cross. 
It's because Jesus rose out of that grave, and it's because one day we know that Jesus will return and make it all right again. Look at John's words from Revelation 21. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And then I saw a holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither will there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write it down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We get this wonderful glimpse of what it's going to look like in heaven and we see God there dwelling with man. We see God there being our God. And it says there will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. It's because death is no more. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing to know that one day everything will be made new and there won't even be a physical death anymore. There won't even be physical pain anymore. And that's all possible because God said Jesus. That's all possible because of the crucifixion and the resurrection. The nightmare is over. The nightmare of death is gone. Here's Paul's words from uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the moral, moral puts on the immortality, then it will come to pass the thing that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It says, for the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, the sting of death is no more. The sting of death is now gone. The nightmare of death is gone because it is all swallowed up in the victory of the resurrection of Jesus. And because of that, we have life. We have life through Jesus, but... But that victory is only there if we come to Jesus. Jesus is the only way that death will be resolved. Jesus is the only way that this nightmare is inescapable by humanity. Jesus told these famous words to Nicodemus well, when Nicodemus was looking for the kingdom of God. He says, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not die but will have eternal life. For God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the only answer. And for those in the world that don't have Jesus, for those in the world that have a religion other than, than Jesus, they're still under that nightmare of death. They're still under that nightmare of death because they haven't found that answer yet. You know, we started off this teaching time by looking at some of the Old Testament beliefs of what happened after death. Well, guess what? The Jews are just as confused today as they were um, in the first century and before. Some modern day Jews believe in a heaven type place. Some believe in Sheol still. Some believe in a reincarnation based cycle. Some believe there's no life after death. Hindus believe in reincarnation of the soul into another body. Buddhists believe in actual reincarnation. Muslims believe in a form of heaven and hell, depending on how well you lived your life. Atheists and agnostics believe, uh, obviously believe that there is no life after death. Spiritualists believe that the soul moves on to a spiritual realm where it continues to evolve. All of these beliefs, all of these beliefs are false. And all of these beliefs are fully void of hope. Because the only answer to death is Jesus. The only answer to death is the fact that Jesus went to the cross and took that death for us. And when we put our faith in Jesus, that nightmare is gone. 
We put our faith in Jesus. There is no fear in death, but there is an anticipation of eternity. Look at Paul's words in 2 Corinthians uh, 5 as we close. It says, He who has prepared, prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not sight. Yes, we are of good courage, courage because we would rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. You see, God has prepared a home for us with him. And he paid for that by sending Jesus. He paid for that by sending Jesus uh, down to Bethlehem in the first century. He paid for that by sending Jesus to the cross. He paid for that by having him take the nails and the crown of thorns and the spear in the side. He paid for that in the grave. And when Jesus came out of that grave victorious, the nightmare was over. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we are so thankful that this nightmare of death is over. We're so thankful that even though we as human beings and even though we as sinners deserve that death, deserve eternal death, that that's not what you have for us. God, we're so thankful that we can uh, open up your word and see uh, Jesus' words to Mary and Martha, to see Jesus' words to his disciples in the upper room so that we can have hope, so that we can have hope that because of his death, that we don't have to fear death and that we can look forward to eternity. God, we love you and we're yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful we were allowed to come to your house this morning. Be with us now uh, as we leave this place. Uh, let us be people who are full of life, full of you, so that as we go into this world, people can see the hope that we have uh, because of you. Uh, we love you. We're yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.